What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bug of the Week. My name is Brayden, and I'm super stoked today because today we are talking about dragonflies. All right, we are continuing our journey through the phylogeny of all of the insect orders. Next up on the list is Odonata, or the dragonflies and damselflies. Before we get started about dragonflies and damselflies, I want to mention something that is super important and special for the further development of the insects and that is wings. So Odonata are the first member of this lineage that we've been going through, the first of the insects to have wings. So why is this so significant, you might be asking? It is thought that one of the reasons that insects are so successful, you know, the most successful animals on the history of this planet is partly because of their wings. So starting with the dragonflies and all members below that, so all further insects are all members of a group called Pterygoda. So remember how I was talking about with those other insects we've been covering? The more basal groups are ancestrally apterous, meaning they do not have wings. Their ancestors did not have wings. But starting with the dragonflies and all members later, all have wings or their ancestors have wings. So obviously it works really well, right? The insect flight has been one of the reasons that insects are so successful. There are many reasons for that. Number one is that they can inherit new niches in the environment. So, you know, being able to fly, they were able to monopolize on niches that weren't taken advantage of at the time when this happened. There's a lot of mysteries about the evolution of the wings in the insects, which is very exciting, but that's one of the reasons we think that insects are so successful. Another thing is that insects always gain their wings in the adult stage, which means that they can also take advantage of different niches from their immature versions. So they're also occupying different niches from the immature larval stages, which is really important for competition, resources, and all of those kinds of things. So you might be thinking, well, Brayden, what's so special about insect wings? If you think about every other winged creature, every other creature that can fly, and there are only a couple of them, that would be birds, bats, and, you know, the pterodons, the extinct uh, pterodactyl kind of animals. If you think about it, something that all of those animals have in common is that those wings are actually modified versions of their forelegs. So birds and bats only have two walking legs, and then their forelegs have been modified into wings. That is why insects are so special. Insects still have all of their sets of legs. They have three sets of legs and two sets of wings that are independent from legs. So like I said, there are a lot of mysteries about the evolution of the insect wings, but it is thought that these wings are not modified versions of limbs, but rather completely independent structures. So it's really, really cool. So starting with this group, Odonata, and moving forward, these are all members of the group Pterygoda, meaning the winged insects. So this is where insects started popping off. So Odonata is a really great example of that, and we're going to talk all about dragonflies and damselflies today because they are super rad. So first of all, let's get some of their taxonomy out of the way. So far, there are about 5,000 species of Odonata currently described, and like I said, this consists of dragonflies and damselflies. Dragonflies make up the suborder Anisoptera, and damselflies make up the suborder Zygoptera. So let's start with a little bit of the anatomy of the Odonata. And something that is super characteristic of the Odonata is their clear, veined, papery wings. So they have two sets of these wings, and, you know, they're very wide and skinny, very long. The wingspan of the Odonates can range between 0.71 inches up to 7.5 inches. That is a very big wingspan as far as insects go, but even crazier, there are some fossil ancestors of today's Odonates that have wingspans of more than 28 inches. And I'm going to talk a bit more about these wings in a minute, but I just want to get over their anatomy. Next up is their body and their abdomen. They have a very characteristic, very long, slender abdomen, which is uh, very unique to the Odonates. This abdomen is also kind of articulating, which comes into play when we talk about courtship. Also their head, they have a head, but most of it is eyeballs. So their compound eyes are very, very, very large compared to the rest of the 
size of their head, and that is so that they can adjust quickly in flight. So the Odinates are very, very adept at flying. They're really, really good at flying. They're like the fighter jets of the insect world, so they are able to make very quick, precise changes in flight at very high speeds, and that is partly to do with their large eyes. Right under their eyes are their mouth parts. These mouth parts are chewing, biting. All of Odonata are carnivorous, so they hunt insects right out of the air. Uh, it's really impressive to watch. They, they're like a hawk. They literally dive other insects and snatch them right out of the air. It's it's amazing. Lastly, their antennae are highly reduced, whisker-like, and that's mostly so that they don't get in the way while they're flying, and they kind of make up for the lack of large antennae with their eyes. All right, now that we're out of the way with the anatomy, as you can tell, they are very, very unique-looking insects, so they're quite easy to identify. Okay, now let's get to the wings. I wanted to talk about the wings. Like I said, the Odinata are very, very good flyers. They're really, really good at flying. They can fly really quickly, make quick, precise changes in their flight patterns. And that's mostly to do with the mechanism of their flight. So there's a very unique wing system that Odonata and the insect we're talking about next week, Ephemeroptera, have, and that is called direct flight muscles. So you can see here that there are muscles in the thorax of the Odonata that pull directly on the wings. And you might be thinking, well, Brayden, that makes a lot of sense, right? Isn't that kind of obvious? It's actually really not. Most insects do not have that. They have something called indirect flight muscles, which we'll talk about when we get there. But the Odonata and our bug next week both have direct flight muscles. So why do these flight muscles only exist in these two insect orders and none of the other ones? And it's because there is a massive drawback. So first of all, the benefit is that they're very, very accurate, fast, and strong. But the drawback is much more extreme, and it's that they are extremely expensive to make and power. So the metabolism of a dragonfly is crazy fast. They burn through food and calories like crazy. So basically what this causes is the adult stages of both Odonata and Ephemeroptera are extremely short. We're talking a couple days. They're only adults for a couple days before they die because they essentially die of starvation, over exhaustion because they can't fuel the muscles. But it works just well enough. They're able to get around and hunt for just long enough to find mates and keep the population going. So if you've ever been outside and you have seen a dragonfly dead on the ground, just, just laying there, just perfectly fine, but dead, that's why. It's because they just don't live very long as adults. So I've been talking about dragonflies versus damselflies. Well, what's the difference? How do you how do you tell them apart? So I would say the most obvious and easy to spot characteristic is when they land. When dragonflies land, they hold their wings out flat. Right, They hold them out flat against the ground. But when damselflies land, they fold them up. So that's one of the main reasons that you can tell them apart. Another one is that damselflies often have much longer, more slender abdomens and longer, more slender wings, whereas the dragonflies have a little bit thicker abdomens and a little bit wider wings. Dragonflies in general are a little more beefy than the damselflies are. Another thing that I've noticed is that dragonflies usually have more of a round bulbous head, whereas damselflies have a more long pill-shaped head, if that makes sense. All right, so now how about their development? So this is another place where these insects change a lot of the rest of the lineage. So we've been talking about with those other ancestral insects, the first two, Archaeognatha and Zygentoma. If you've missed those episodes, go catch up. But those are ametabolous insects, meaning they do not really have a metamorphosis. The Odonata are where that changes. So the Odonates and moving forward, all of the insects after the Odonates have a clear metamorphosis. So the Odonata are the first of the hemimetabolous insects. So hemimetaboly is when an egg hatches into something we call a nymph. The nymph is a fairly independent, free-living insect that often lacks some of the characteristics of the adult. So the nymphs, you know, go through a series of molts, and then on their last molt, they molt into an adult. That rhymed. 
um, <laughs> gaining their wings, reproductive structures, all of those kinds of things. So like I said, the dragonflies do not live very long as a adult. So they live most of their life in their various nymph stages. So this is the nymph of a odonate, and we call them naiads. Not really sure why, but th th that's just what we call them. And you'll notice that these look nothing like the dragonflies. So there is obviously a clear metamorphosis, but the dragonfly and damselfly nymphs are super, super cool. So they're actually aquatic. So they live in freshwater streams, lakes, ponds, things like that. And they are actually super predatory. And so when they're in the freshwater ecosystems, they eat all kinds of stuff. They eat small aquatic bugs. They eat small crustaceans. Some more extreme examples is even some like tiny, tiny tadpoles or baby fish. They are super cool, really good at catching their prey. So they swim around the fresh water until they are mature enough to climb out of the water, molt into the adult dragonfly, and go about their business. But the naiads actually have this really interesting structure called a labial mask. And it's basically these mandibles that are articulating and they can reach out and grab things. Quite impressive. So how do you tell the damselfly nymphs apart from the dragonfly nymphs? And that's a really great question. It's mostly to do with their gills. So yes, aquatic insect larvae often have gills a little different from fish gills, but we call them the same thing. And most of the time, dragonfly gills are on the abdomen. So on the underside of the abdomen or on the side of the abdomen, but here, compared to a damselfly nymph, you can see the gills are feather-like and they come off the end of the abdomen. All right, now let's move on to courtship, everybody's favorite part. <laughs> Anyways, so I just kind of want to talk about this because it's kind of cute and funny. That one on the bottom is the male. And like I said, they have this articulating abdomen. So they're able to articulate it in certain ways. And when they're mating, they make a little heart. So I just thought that was kind of cute. But um, yeah, not much more than that. That's interesting. All right. And with that, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment down below. Uh, let me know if I missed anything or maybe your favorite part or if you learned anything. I really love the Odinates. I think I say that every episode, but oh well, here we are. Anyway, leave a like, subscribe if you liked this episode, and I will see you all next week for the next episode of Bug of the Week. Next week, we are talking about Ephemeroptera, which are the mayflies. But with that, I will see you all next week, but until then, keep on bugging. See ya.